You're listening to theoutdoorstation.co.uk. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to another podzine dated the 28th of April 2008. Well, hi everybody and welcome once again to another Podzine and what an exciting show we've got for you this week. Um, and what sort of week have you had? I've had quite a good week actually. Um, I hope you've picked up the recent podcasts we put out uh, from Cicerone Press, a whole range of content there from different authors which are absolutely fascinating and uh, <laughs> I hope there's uh, there's a lot there for you to listen to. Um, we also did the Hedgerow Forage um, which uh, has gone down very well with people. I see the number of people downloading that has increased increased uh, exponentially and um, that seems to be going well as uh, and attracting a lot of interest from all different members of the outdoors community um, I mentioned um, last week I was going on another fungi forage a springtime one with the local group and I'm, and I must recommend people do that actually do do join um, find them through your local libraries I guess or, or um, horticultural societies but there must be a fungi group near you because it's absolutely fascinating there's a wealth of knowledge and very interesting people with all sorts of different aspects and different interests in the countryside um, that go along to these things and uh, share quite willingly their knowledge and uh, understanding and experience, um, all of which is fascinating. I did take my recording gear with me, but um, it didn't quite work out to be a, a good session, so I, I just enjoyed the walk and learned a lot of things about uh, different uh, fruits and plants uh, and certainly things that were coming through uh, in the springtime. Now, talking of which, um, we normally mention people's blogs on, on this particular introduction. We've had uh, Richard Harding on his cycling blog and Mick and Gail that we've mentioned the last couple of weeks who are uh, on their Land's End to John O'Groats walk. So uh, do look them up and uh, enjoy a read with them. They see them in the contacts page. Um, but I thought I'd just have a quick look at around um, the uh, the blogosphere, as it were, to see who's talking about the various aspects of what's happening this springtime. And by that I mean on the food front, because I do enjoy my nosh. Uh, so the first one we're quickly going to have a look at is Hannah's Country Kitchen and you can find that at Hannah's countrykitchen.blogspot.com and uh, it's quite an interesting uh, website not only from sort of uh, the farming aspect and the rural aspect and the food aspect but also food presentation and so on uh, and she's got various links with uh, the Country File magazine um, and that's another website worth looking at certainly uh, there's a wealth of things coming through I suppose partly uh, to do with the um, divergence of, of uh, digital media and online media there's a lot of information coming through from all sorts of different sources but certainly um, you could spend many a happy hour over a cup of coffee looking at Hannah's Country Kitchen dot blogspot uh, as I mentioned the um, the the says hunting down his shortcuts list <laughs> the BBC Country Farm magazine now um, they're working really hard as well at building up a community uh, based on people with rural interests uh, albeit the uh, um, farming based or food based or just enjoying walking in the countryside so uh, do pop by and have a look at their site. It's uh, simply www.bbccountryfile.com. Uh, they've also got a podcast as well, which is uh, quite interesting, where they talk about some of the articles coming through in the magazine. And a very healthy forum section, which is slowly building, uh, looking at different aspects of countryside matters, uh, be they wildlife, walking, field sports or food. Um, and finally, let's have a look at somebody else's. Let's have a pop over to uh, one of the bloggers. Uh, let's, uh, he said, picking randomly off his list of hundreds of bloggers. Well, my old chum who helps us out on the uh, the outdoor station, Andy Howell. Now, you can find uh, Andy Howell's uh, website at www.andyhowell.info. -E and um, Andy, 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 <laughs> if he is, Andy, Andy, it's... Um, is is one of the most prolific um, UK bloggers for out, uh, outdoors walking and outdoors activities, uh, and he certainly does get a hell of a lot of uh, traffic through his website, a lot of comments from a whole variety of people, uh, and he also links to um, a whole range of other bloggers as well. And there is plenty to uh, view on there about uh, new products coming through, some of his experiences, walking in the Pyrenees, uh, various people he's spoken to, and uh, he's very much, like me, um, a supporter of the T 
TGO Challenge, which is the Cross Scotland Walk uh, organised by the TGO magazine, which uh, neither he and I are on this year, but uh, we're still interested to see what everybody's doing and finding out about some of the main characters. So let's get back to uh, to the show. What have we got on? Well, we've got um, quite an interesting setup for you this time. We have got um, a fantastic interview with uh, Andy Rouse, a well-known wildlife photographer. Uh, we have a great interview with uh, Paramo. Catherine Whitehead, uh, marketing manager of Paramo, tells us about the uh, company's commitment to ethical production. Um, but first, we have a chat with uh, John Penny, who is the product intelligence manager at Canon, about some of the new products coming through for 2000. And eight, which I'm sure is going to appeal to many outdoors people. Well, we've just introduced in January a range of uh, new cameras which bring a whole, whole range of feature sets previously available at higher price points down to, um, to a more accessible range so that more people can get better photos for less money and less time and effort. Very simple and easy to use. So um, two models that we have in our range right now are the Digital Lexus 80 IS, which we just unveiled in January, and then we have the PowerShot G9. And essentially our, our compact camera range is divide, comprised of two, uh, two ranges. So there's Digital Lexus, which is small, compact, light, iconic, styled, slip in your pocket, carry anywhere, but still very capable. And then for the more enthusiast, then we have the uh, more traditional looking compact range, the PowerShot range, which give you far more control and versatility. Well, I know the G9 is, is a very capable piece of equipment, and we'll come on to that in a second, because I think there's a, there's a lot of aspects on that and features that uh, we'll take some time to explore. Uh, but uh, on this one, uh, is this part of a series, or is this the, the sort of the, the, the only one of its type, as it were, in that range? There's, there's, there's a range within our Digital Lexus range. There are about six in the lineup right now. This is the latest edition. Um, it comes in uh, four fantastic flavours. Um, this is the, the silver finish. We've got, uh, we've got it in... Uh, four different colours as well and as you can see the, from the feel it's it's stylish curved aluminium very neat compact sits in the hand beautifully um, so for, for the outdoors person in, in specifically then um, how are we as regards shot protection and waterproofing with, with that particular model um, in terms of uh, shot protection it's it's a robust body. It looks quite diminutive, quite fragile, but it's it's tremendously tough because, as I say, it's styled uh, it's styled from aluminium. Um, it's compact and lightweight, so you, you can slip it in a pocket to um, in inclement weather, uh, as we're used to in the in the UK. Um, for the more adventurous, we actually do it range of uh, underwater housings as well. So. Uh, if you're uh, you know, away out on the coast, you can uh, either put it in a weatherproof case to protect it from the sand on the beach, for example, or there's uh, a waterproof case, as I say, which normally you can dive down to maybe up to 40 metres. All oh, right, OK, so it's, it's, it's fairly flexible from that point of view. Um, now, it's, it's an 8-megapixel mega camera, so that's obviously quality-wise going to give you as, as uh, what, what, what is currently accepted as being the top of the range. Mm -hmm. What are the actual uh, sort of the function sets? Is it fully automatic? Is there any manual override? It's... It's, it's fully automatic, um, very simple and easy to use. Um, we've got uh, three times lens with image stabilisation. So the first time that our image stabilisation has made it down to a, an entry-level Pixels product, again, helps tremendously in low light or in times where you're, um, again, in dark with maybe trees overhanging or um, where instances where you're not allowed to use flash. Um, yeah, or on a canoe or when it's windy day or exactly. it's, it's being blown around a bit. Exactly, and uh, one of the, one of the um, recent innovations that we've seen across our range is, uh, is face detection. Lots of people are taking photos, particularly of you know, friends, relative portraits, out and about, me in front of uh, buildings, for example. Um, and quite often they're shooting in what are quite tricky shooting circumstances, whether it be uh, you know, a holiday or a family event. And with now the camera can actually recognise faces within the frame and set the exposure. So you're going to get fantastic uh, results every time. That's a, that's a phenomenal piece of technology. How, how does it actually... What's the science behind it? Well, essentially the, the, the camera can... Uh, can detect individual face types, whether it be, um, again, uh, eyes and mouth, and can detect up to nine within a frame. And you can choose, new for this year, we've added face select and track. So not only can it detect a face, um, you can also get it to track and continuously track a face within a frame. And that's really useful often when you see yourselves at maybe some uh, you know, outdoor events that are quite popular. You're trying to take a couple of you know, shots a couple of your friends, and you'll get somebody else will join. 
and, and often um, previous cameras that would the focus would switch to that person who's joined the scene. Mm. Now you can track and uh, select and track your your friends around the frame, which is uh, really really versatile. Wow, that's incredible. So so if you you've, you've chosen the person you wanted to to track, mm -hmm. and that person is changing the focal distance, it's, it's changing distance from you. So obviously yep. there's a zooming, uh, yep. there's a focusing element yep. there, uh, and they're also tracking across the frame. So they go from the center of the frame to the left hand side of the frame, and you're trying to catch up with their movements, shall we say, it will keep that person in focus. Indeed. And we're talking about face uh, detection not only for auto uh, auto focus, we're talking about um, auto exposure, so auto flash, and also white balance now. So under any combination of uh, lighting conditions, uh, you'll get beautifully exposed shots of people. That is a superb, superb piece of science, and this is across the whole Canon range as well, I presume. Indeed, indeed. So many of the range that we introduced in, uh, in January also share this technology. What's what's neat as well is we also get um, AF frame zooming. So normally, when you're half pressing the shutter, you can see what's in the AF frame, what's been selected as the focus point. Now that uh, that 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 area can be exaggerated; it can be zoomed, so you can actually check the focus to make sure that actually your subject is smiling because it's very simple and easy to see. So we're getting a really useful tool to make sure, yeah, we're going to get just the shot we're looking for. Okay, well, a couple of other things I want to ask you on that camera. The um, battery, I take it's a, a lithium battery? Indeed. Um, lithium ion, which is, it's small, it's light, it's compact. It's very, uh, got great, great charge life, so we're looking at maybe uh, 300 shots, something like that. And, and a recharge time of maybe an hour and a half, something like that. Very simple and easy to use. And again, because of their size, you know, it's not inconceivable that you can take another one out with you, uh, should you so desire. Uh, and what about the, the movie aspect now? This is a question that seems to be cropping up and, and sort of confusing the marketplace slightly at the moment. Is it a still camera or is it a movie camera? Because presumably it takes movies as well. Indeed, indeed. And that's, and that's an interesting question because, again, uh, yeah, we're seeing increasing convergence um, and people wanting to say, well, actually, you know, I just want to take one device with me and, and capture. So, yes, you can shoot movies with this as well. There's also a, uh, a time lapse a time lapse function as well. So you can record a, uh, you know, maybe a two seconds every 10 seconds, 5 seconds, oh, so okay. on and so forth, over a period of time, which, again, um, just left uh, next to your campsite as you're you know, erecting the tent might be fascinating to look, you know, <laughs> didn't we do well in the rain? Yeah, so. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. So what's the price point of that one then, please? Uh, we're looking at uh, 199 for this camera. And that's going to be available, or it's available now, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Okay. So let's um, move on from, from that one, which is a very nice little unit, which slits it easily in a GPS pocket or on a phone pouch, uh, to, to the G9, which is a, a bit more of a juicier um, tool, and I, I know it's got a lot of pro features to it as well. Indeed, indeed. So uh, this this finds our G series has been um, the uh, the you know the epitome of our range for for a very long time now. Um, aspirational for some, but um, also very very popular with professional users. Um, so maybe a, an SLR user on their day off or days out not wanting to take all their kit with them will take one of these quite happily. One of the key reasons for that is that you can shoot in raw mode. Mm. So you've got uh, raw recording which gives you huge advantage in terms of um, effects, uh, control of uh, tonality. Mm. Correction after the event really. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And in terms of uh, its use, whereas some cameras, obviously this one's quite small and diminutive, this is a more traditional feel very simple and intuitive to use so we've got uh, control here to adjust the ISO very simple and familiar M more resembling a rangefinder camera which which people will have uh, you know, known and loved as, as they've grown up huge screen on the back so three inch display which makes things very very easy to use we've got a flash hot shoe mount again so uh, as the light goes down we don't need to stop shooting and a huge six times image stabilized lens on there so it's giving enormous range from 35 to 210 millimeters, which um, is tremendous reach. In, in addition, we can also add um, lens converters. So really? Right. That range can be extended yet further. So I, I presume, once again, this is powered by, uh, by lithiums again, and it's a 12 megapixel camera, isn't it? Indeed. Indeed. So this is uh, bags of detail for, um, again, makes it great for uh, enlargements or indeed you know, making crops of a particular picture to capture one element of the scene and then you can enlarge it with, with, with confidence. Is the, uh, the camera's physically larger than the, the Exus there? Is the, is, it, is the sensor larger as well? Um, yes, so the, uh, the, the, the sensor's um, uh, slightly larger, gives it better um, light sensitivity, better light capture, um, and uh, a 
incredible amounts of detail. Uh, and and the, coming back to the battery on this one, what, what's it good for as regards number of shots and so on? Because I can imagine people, it's a more robust camera, there's obviously the, 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 there's more stature to it, and it's definitely got a more solid feel to it, so I presume the body body is obviously uh, obviously of a, more, of a stronger structure as well. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to think about the, the weight of batteries and that sort of thing you're carrying with you. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 solid and robust, um, and the battery itself is, is bigger. So this is um, shared across some of our um, entry-level SLR products as well. Um, so it, again, perfect fit there because many people would use this as a, as a second camera with that body so um, they can share the batteries um, but yet you know it's solid and robust and yet you know fairly compact and will we'll fit in a coat pocket yeah indeed uh, what about the actual weatherproofing of these uh, again this um, it's very well sealed so the, the you know yeah. all the all surfaces meet nicely so again it, it'll be resistant to a certain amount of uh, you know uh, rain and uh, rain and dust but again um, slips into a coat pocket fantastic we ourselves again make a, a, a waterproof housing so the more adventurous can uh, can take this away with them should they want to okay well at the the focus show here you're obviously meeting a lot of the end users a lot of consumers that have bought the products over the years and, and, and giving you feedback and so on uh, is there we could you define the type of customer that, that actually has these or the previous models of these cameras uh, as, as part of their uh, as part of their equipment sure I think um, that I say the G series has been uh, tremendously popular found favor with a lot of uh, camera enthusiasts Again, people who've uh, been used to um, having that control, the unique amount of control that this camera will give you. Um, it's, you know, it's an SLR in terms of its control, but in a more diminutive form factor, so you can carry it everywhere and yet still get the quality of result that you expect to see from your SLR camera. Right, and I presume then the, the access range is ideal for sort of ramblers, really, that uh, or, or gap year travellers that want to something simple to to carry with them, light and, and remember the trip. Slip in a pocket and you know capture those priceless memories that you you wouldn't ever be able to get with without having that small camera with you. Okay, and finally, question then: What's the price point on the G9? Uh, we're looking at about uh, four hundred pounds for one of these. <laughs> And what a thing of beauty the G9 is. Uh, I bought mine a few weeks back, uh, just after the show, actually, and uh, it is incredible. The results it gives you uh, from uh, certainly in 12 megapixels, but raw, uh, are just phenomenal. And certainly it competes quite handsomely with my um, a bit more expensive SLR. So from now on on my outdoor trips, I'm going to be using my G9. Um, and as I say, it is a, a thing of beauty and something very, very uh, good to, to use because it's also manual and completely uh, automatic as well, so you can have one or the other, which appeals to all sorts of different levels of photographer. And would you believe uh, Canon and uh, John Penny have donated a Canon G9 to us for our competition this week? Yes, we've got a £400 top-of-the-range compact camera to give away. So make sure you uh, stay listening to the end of the show and join in with the competition. Thank you very much indeed, Canon. This is going to be a cracker of a competition. So let's move on with the show itself uh, and back to the outdoors show uh, where uh, Andy Howell uh, met up with Catherine Whitehead, uh, who is the marketing manager at Paramo. As ever at the outdoors show, one of the busiest stands is the Paramo stand. And uh, Paramo is certainly a, a unique set of products. But one of the things that makes them a little bit different is their commitment to... Um, ethical manufacturing, ethical purchasing, and this year Paramo are making quite a splash of that. And uh, Catherine, tell us about um, Paramo's commitment to everything ethical, because the, even down to the, man, the, the manufacturing of the, the gear is, is something very different. It's a different kind of story, isn't it? Yes, we, we've we um, found a lot of people now are talking about ethical and so on, and we've been doing it for quite a long time. In fact, right from the very beginning, um, Nick Brown, when he wanted to manufacture garments, um, manufactured a few in the UK and then went out to South America to try them out on the area called the Paramo, which is the cold, very wet plain up there, and um, came across um, a nun out there, Sister, Ma Sister Madre Esther Castiano, or something like that, who was running a little sewing workshop with two second-hand sewing machines. And he thought, oh, maybe I could 
manufacture some stuff here. And so 15 years ago, she'd already been in existence 15 years then doing her, her workshop um, in 1992 or thereabouts. He actually began manufacturing there with her. And now it's, it's grown and grown, as you can see from the figures, you know, amazing how we have that impact. It's lovely to think of it actually all coming from Paramount. Now, um, in Colombia, yep. um, the, working with the nuns, you're actually uh, providing quite an important income for uh, a significant sector of, of that community, aren't you? Yeah, it's actually grown and grown and grown, and it's, it's great to see it because not only are we providing employment and training for, for something like 300, 400 women every year who so they can either carry on working in the factory or go off and work in other clothing factories, which is a growing industry in Colombia, but we're also helping to look after their children. Many of these women are ex-prostitutes or drug users from the streets of Bogota, and they actually have got children and those children need care or they would just go the same route because they wouldn't have any other way to get money and you've got about 1500 children there getting you know getting meals going through the schools and the kindergartens every day um, being using the virtual library that's been set up there and living in the houses that have been built there as well by all by the the Michalina foundation which is the name of, of the charitable foundation that we we use or are at the basis of, of our factory there well, I guess you could have gone to Vietnam or manufactured the Far East like everybody else, but that sounds fascinating. So. I mean, we do actually produce some of our stuff in Vietnam now. We found that, oh, it must be three, four years ago, we were in danger of, of becoming unethical in Michalina because we were putting so much work their way, they just couldn't deal with it, and they were working three shifts a day. So we actually took a bit of stuff away and began producing it in Vietnam, and we're now hoping, fingers crossed, to do the same sort of um, job over there, if you like, and perhaps set up our own ethical foundation but over just there. so that people uh, don't get the wrong end of the stick of that I mean that that relationship with that community in Colombia is a long term one and one that you're going to be using for years to come I guess definitely I mean there's no danger at all that we will move it elsewhere we really value that and hopefully they value us as well well it'd be very interesting to see if you can come to a similar kind of arrangement in Vietnam as well yeah. that'd, be, that'd be good now this year you, you're, you're pushing out the ethical promotion a little bit on the stand and um, there's a slogan here which says choosing power mo a relationship that lasts so so talk us through the thinking around this industry. Well, it was, it was really a lot of talk about recycling and using recycled products and putting things in recycling bins and polyester and so on. Um, our garments are 100% polyester in, in most cases, anyway, virtually all cases. And um, But we didn't want people to just think they could chuck it away and buy another one because I think that's the wrong end of the stick, really, when it comes to recycling. And what we call recycling is putting those garments... After all, our garments can last you know a long time I mean people are yeah, still to be a long time. <laughs> and people are still bringing us back garments they had 15 years ago and they're still working perfectly so it means either giving your garment away to someone else who can use it um, and we've actually done some of that in-house we actually do um, some work with Fairbridge who a community uh, a project that take um, youth out on the hill really as part of um, a retraining program and so on and um, we've done some work with Remploy as well and getting their people out on the hill so that's one one route we've taken if you like is to make sure that that those products get reused and get recycled um, and um, I mean just looking at, uh, at at the display here you, there's a section that talks about giving back to the outdoors um, working with the World Land Trust uh, in restoring land and minimising carbon emissions. Um, tell us about that. Well, I know kind of offsetting carbon emissions sometimes raises some eyebrows and people worry about it, but obviously if you can actually do that, if you can actually begin that process, then that's that's fantastic. And we've been working with the World Land Trust. We did a lot of research before choosing them, um, and they actually don't just kind of let you cancel out your carbon emissions, but they're much more involved in actually protecting rainforest areas, building new rainforest areas, and they work locally. So they, they empower the local people people in Ecuador or Colombia or wherever. So, so this isn't just planting in a, a load of more pine trees in some place in Scotland, this is about actually tackling 
some of the real areas of really serious rainforest deprivation. Mention, yeah, absolutely. And um, we've actually set up a 10-year plan with them if you like to, to get rid of 20 years emissions at the moment so for every year we do now we're paying double so that we can do our 10 years ago as well so by the time we've done 10 years we'll have offset 20 um, and, is, and is it true that for every jacket that you sell you're donating a sapling is that what? It's the um, the Pajaro jacket in particular, which is our, our bird watching jacket. We we actually donate a sapling to another company, which is working in Caledonian Forest in in Scotland, called Trees for Life. So there's that angle too. We've also worked with Andy Rouse, who we've got here on our stand today. Um, he's a, a very famous international wildlife photographer, taking some fantastic pictures of surfing penguins and bears, and he's off to India on, on Sunday, actually, to take some tigers. Um, and he and us set up together the Aspira Fund. We came up with a range of garments that Andy likes to use for his photography, and for every every bit of the profit goes into the Aspira Fund and that's actually donated to different projects each year. So this year, for example, we've donated to a Rwandan charity working with youth in Rwanda and also to a Kapakali um, project that's going through Forestry Commission. So, And he's already, Andy's already got some ideas in mind, which is his tiger, um, at the moment his tigers are going to benefit hopefully next year. Now, this commitment to the ethical obviously is distinctive and it gives you a distinctive marketing edge. But in terms of mainstream business, is it good for business as well? I think it is. I think it does. And in fact, with us, it goes a lot deeper, I have to say. I mean, Nick Brown, if you've, if you've spoke to him, he's deeply, deeply of the belief that we've got to stop climate change, that we have to give back to the community. I mean, he started work with the Michelina Foundation because he really believes in it and putting stuff back. And so it, it runs right through our company, really. It's, it's not about marketing, that's for sure. That, it just makes more work for marketing, I have to say. <laughs> well, perhaps one day all outdoor companies will be as committed as, as Paramo. Catherine, thanks very much for that, and good luck for the future. Thanks very much. See you. So what's happening soon in the great outdoors? The Podzine Diary. Well, let's uh, catch up on the, the outdoorsstation.co.uk website and have a look at the What's On Diary and just remind people some of the things coming through uh, end of April, beginning of May. Uh, of course, uh, this weekend just gone was the uh, Backpackers Club meeting in Derbyshire, which uh, hopefully wasn't too rained upon. Uh, moving into May, let's have a look at May. Now, there are links on the diary page to all these different events or uh, people organising them or uh, contact details or t tourist information centres. So if you're stuck for an idea or something to do, um, I've tried to gather together as many things as possible and people have sent me information of things going on um, around the country during the next few months. Uh, starting at the beginning of May, we've got the Wild Heart Gathering in Sussex. Now, I mentioned this last week um, at a paid affair. It's six Sixty-five pounds a ticket, for, but it's for five days, and it's. Uh, I think it'd be a very, very interesting thing to attend. Actually, it brings together bushcraft, outdoor pursuits, conservation, sustainable land use, deep ecology, nature awareness, rites of passage. Um, and many, many other things. Um, wildheartgathering.com. So have a look at that, see if that interests you. Uh, at the same time, beginning of May, we've got the North Devon and Exmoor Walking Festival. Uh, that's kicking off. Uh, information at uh, Ilfacombe TIC, Walking North Devon, uh, walking in northdevon.co.uk. Uh, and in, during that time, there's also um, a taste of wild food. Now, if you did enjoy that uh, podcast I did with uh, Diana, uh, looking in the hedgerows and so on, this is doing exactly the same thing. It's a speciality walk led by Phil Gray of Wilderness Ways, and it's about five and a half miles walk down woodland paths and hedgerows to discover the origins and uses of British flora and fauna, both in cooking and medicine. And that's on the 4th of May. Um, information again in Walking in North Devon or wildernessways.co.uk. Uh, further north, we've got the Keith Ness and Sutherland Walking Festival, um, which I actually hope to be bumping into myself. Uh, that's the 1st to the 6th of May, and I'm just arriving at uh, Cape Wrath, I think, about that sort of time. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be doing a, uh, some pod zines after this, some weekly ones. This will be the end for uh, probably a couple of weeks, uh, because I shall be away doing the Cape Wrath Trail. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So if I see anybody up there, I'll try and uh, see how they're getting on with that walking festival. 
Uh, now, the Open Canoe Associ Association are having their annual rally uh, up in uh, Lake Windermere. Um, again, it's a, a paid event. It's £60 for adult members, uh, £75 for non-members. Uh, but again, a fantastic uh, three, four days of everything you want to know and do and be involved with and find out about open canoe um, travel, uh, be it for hobbies or sports or, or whatever it might be. So that would be definitely uh, something worth visiting, uh, even if you just had a curiosity to see if it's the sort of thing for you and the family. Uh, locally, we've got Upton Folk Festival at the beginning of May, always good for a knees up and a... Um, <laughs> drink of cider uh, then we have got the uh, sort of other events really which were sort of sporting and, and then healthy outdoor types like the National Windsurfing Week 3rd of May, International Bike um, International Beach Kite Festival 4th of May uh, where's that, that's at Weymouth and the National Windsurfing Week is being held where exactly it doesn't tell you, but you can find out on nationalwindsurfingweek.org. Uh, the Isle of Wight Walking Festival kicking off as well, beginning of May. Um, the Welsh National Open Surfing Championships in Pembrokeshire, 5th of May. English Surfing Championships on the 5th of May. They're all at it. They're all in the water, aren't they? Bit of sunshine, they go mad. Uh, they've got the Prestating Walking Festival as well on the 9th of May. So really, there's no excuse not to get out and about somewhere. So these are in Wales. We had Scotland. Uh, where else? We've got Aviemore and the Cairngorms Walking Mountain Festival, uh, 10th to the 17th of May. I hope you don't bump into too many of the TGO challenges as you do your thing. Oldswater Walking Festival on the 10th of May. Uh, visit oldswater.com. Uh, what have you else? We've got uh, Craster Walk of Northumberland, um, Festival of Harbour Walks. That sounds interesting. And in Chichester. Uh, we've got the very well-publicised Cumberland Ale Keswick Mountain Festival on the 14th to the 18th of May. Uh, and uh, and so it goes on. In fact, as you can probably tell, May is incredibly full and I can't be begin to go through uh, the diary uh, completely uh, because it just goes on and on down the page. So do have a look at uh, theoutdoorstation.co.uk and the diary page and uh, find out what's going on. Of course, we've got my favourite subject, the um, world-famous asparagus auction, uh, coming very soon, and it'd be nice to have that after the starters that we had with the um, the hop shoots, which was uh, courtesy of Diana, which was great. So that's, uh, that's on that uh, podcast if you want to listen to the hedgerow foraging one. So uh, let's get back to the show. Um, right, uh, now, have you ever thought... I have, many a time. In fact, I have changed, but it hasn't quite worked out the way I thought it would do. The exotic world of wildlife photography. Just you, your equipment, out there in the sunshine, nobody else around. No problems, no challenges, no computers. Just capturing pictures of beautiful animals doing their normal thing, selling them and making a fortune, eh? What a, how easy does that sound? So, have you ever felt like stepping out of the box and turning your hobby a skill like photography into a full-time business. Andy Rouse is going to tell you what it's all about. Some people say I have a rock star lifestyle, which is quite amusing on the amount of money I earn. Um, one of my friends actually said that I, I've got a champagne lifestyle on a lemonade budget, and that's about the truth. Um, it looks like I go to places. I'm going to India for two months on Tuesday, right? Paying for all this stuff myself. I'm not on commission. No one's paying for me to go. I'm not travelling business class. You know, and, and everything is done um, on a gamble, really. You know, I'm life's great gambler. That's what I'm doing. I'm gambling on my skill to come back with pictures that might sell in the next 10 years. Mm. I mean, on a, on a trip like that, how many sort of pictures do you, do you reckon you'll come back with? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Um, I'm going to edit every day. I have to edit every day as I go through. Um, so we'll have to wait until I come back to see that. But, yeah, I should. I mean, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I'm very quick. It's what, it's what I specialise in. So hopefully I shouldn't miss when the opportunities present themselves. So. so so, where do these photographs go then? If you're going to India, so let's use that as a good example, really. Yep. You're going there for a couple of months. Presumably yep. you're going to edit on the hoof as you go along in yep. the evening in the hotels or whatever, the, a laptop. Um, y you come back. What, what do you do with the pictures then? Process them. That takes normally a month right. uh, to get them to a standard that clients want to see because you can't just take them out of the camera. That's a mistake. And then um, they'll go to agents like Getty, Corbis, um, agents like this that will sell them to ad agencies. Recently I had a penguin surfing used by Sky and that was sold via Getty because I don't have the contacts to do it and I don't have the time. Um, they'll also go into newspaper articles. I'll do uh, some feature on conservation maybe on tigers. I'll go into art general articles on photography where I'll put tigers in and they'll go into my library on, on my website that clients use and lots of clients come to our library and use calendars, you know, 
pictures for calendars, cards, T-shirts. I've got a range of T-shirts with my pictures on. I mean, you know, anything you can think of with a picture on it, there's clients that come to us. So we're more of a traditional photography model, if you like, of a business in that we sell stock pictures mm. as one part of our business, but it's not the only part of our business. I mean, it sounds, it sounds very grand to say that you sell to the libraries and, and obviously they in turn sell to clients, which is fantastic, but I know from personal experience it takes a while for that money to filter through the system, doesn't it? Depends who you're with. Really? I mean, um, I'm with Getty, and uh, literally the second they're on the site, they can sell, and I've had loads of things um, where Getty have sold a picture um, within a month of it going on the website, and they've sold it for a few thousand pounds. So, um, you know, it, I think it really depends what your pictures show. And my pictures are getting saleable for some reason. Now, I'm taking the pictures that I want to take, but because I'm taking pictures of more space around them now, and more environment, to show, you know, the threats to the environment, so you show the animal in its environment, they also become more saleable for some outrageous reason. Um, and my stuff, rather than a lot of people's who seems to be falling, my stock is going up. Oh, congratulations for that. Well, I don't know that's... why. I've got, I mean, bribery, corruption, <laughs> having blackmail pictures on people. That always helps. Yeah, yeah. I've mean, yes. got some good ones, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cash is always nice. Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> so how much research do you do before you actually go off, uh, set off for a, for a shoot? Um, well, this Indian trip has taken a year to plan. Um, I've been to India three times before, but I've never been in, in such depth. And I don't think I've ever been as good a photographer as I am now. I've not, not been hitting so consistently. So I think um, it's taken me a year to get the best idea, get the right contacts on the ground. I can't just have normal contacts. I've got to have people that are experienced in working with people like me, photographers, you know, filmmakers, whatever. Um, that costs a lot more money. Um, and then I've got to work out when to go, you know, make sure the business at home is left in a good state. So, I mean, effectively we shut the website down um, because we've got no one at home when we're away. No one in the office. We can't afford to have staff. We can't afford that. So. Okay. I mean, you, you, this is, obviously hasn't come out of the, the blue. For people who may, may not have heard your name before, um, it's taken many years to, to build up. Yeah, I've been 12 years a pro now. Um, so, yeah, it's taken a long time, although I, I always said that when I, when, I, when I actually turned professional from being a computer consultant, I had no savings. I literally turned on a whim. I just left my, resigned, resigned from my job, resigned from my marriage, <laughs> just everything, um, all, literally on one day. And I started from scratch and ran a business from that day. And I always think that a lot of the people that don't succeed, you know, as a photographer, if your pictures are good enough, you will succeed. It's as simple as that. It doesn't matter if you're the worst marketeer in the world, you know, and whatever, you speak a different language, it doesn't matter. If your pictures are good enough, you will, you will be professional and you will make money. How do you think the actual uh, market has changed for the, for the actual end user? I, I think the market's changed a lot for the end user and for the photographer because there's a lot more with digital now. Everyone's putting their pictures on the web and everyone offers them for sale and so uh, a client can come along and buy a picture of mine from Getty for £2,000 and they go to a website and they'll get a picture that's perhaps, no offence to anyone, not quite as good um, but you find that you know, they may offer it for £20 because they want to see their picture published. Well, it messes me up and it messes them up too but the client's happy as Larry. Mm. And so I find that that's happening a lot although the kind of clients I deal with generally would never do that. And I have a, I have a lower limit on my sales that I will actually tolerate. Um, which is well above what a lot of clients will actually pay these days. So, you know. With, with, with technology moving the way it's moving, and, and as you say, with uh, digital photography as much as the sort of uh, recording facilities with laptops and so on, do you see any big changes coming, or do you think it's going to sort of level out of where you are at the moment? Um, I don't need any more than I'm not really a gear freak. Um, I use a camera because it's a, it's a vehicle between my eye and the subject, you know. Um, so I, I love animals, so I'm not really a techno geek. Um, I'll use whatever I have. I'm happy to use the digital camera that I have now. I hope they get smaller, and I hope they get lighter, and I hope they get you know an all-in-one lens in them that does everything from wide angle to long zoom. That would be fabulous. I can't see it happening because it is quite fun to use the camera the way it is. You know, it's it, 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 it's fun to do photography, and I think people are just reducing it to too much of a technical level when they should remember that photography is a hobby for a lot for most people, and it should be fun. Do you, do you think generally, I mean, sort of creative creativity uh, that we've seen has changed over the last sort of five or ten years with the d development of digital technology and, and you say the more uh, that's emphasis that's gone into the facility that you've got, the number of megapixels, how fast it is, how light it that's is, whatever it might question. be, has, uh, creativity itself has oh, actually now. suffered? Yeah, that's a great question. My biggest problem with a lot of photographs these days is that they're technically perfect but they have no nothing behind them. They're just like record shots, you know, because people can do that with a digital camera now because the exposure problem has gone 
I can look at it and get it roughly right. But the creativity, because people are shortcutting so much, the creativity seems to have gone a lot. And uh, great, great for me. <laughs> we'll carry it on. But I, I do feel it's a shame to, that a lot of people don't push their photography onwards. And so I try to run these workshops and courses that push people's photography. You know, it pushes the limits of what how they think and tries to get them to improve the photographer. So that's what I try to do. So would you uh, would you recommend it as a lifestyle for somebody for a, as a as a business if they're no. interested in photography? You don't have a chance these days of making a living at it. It's, it's just not a hope. The only people with it. Um, there's, I see all these people around now that give me cards to say professional. And I say, where have your pictures been published? Oh, they haven't. I'm just a millionaire that travels with a load of gear, but they like to be known as a professional. And I see loads of this. And that's great if you what you want to do, but you're not a professional wildlife dog because your living doesn't depend on it. So right now, I don't know anyone in the last 10 years that's turned professional and made a successful living. Because, you know, you've got to think you've got to earn a load of money out of your sales to actually pay for all your travelling and you're not going to do that in the first five years so it's a very hard thing to do so I say to people you know just go and enjoy your photography for what it's for what it is it's a stress buster it's a way of getting out of everyday life and being creative and doing something different the Potsy. wise words indeed there from Andy and thanks very much to him for joining me and uh, for sharing those thoughts yes indeed uh, I know quite a few prof professional photographers these days and they're all saying exactly the same thing it's tough out there so uh, do think twice before giving up your day job but more importantly look at photography as being great fun you know as he said it's a hobby enjoy it allow uh, allow yourself to relax and, and enjoy the pleasure of doing it and capturing the moment and we've been very lucky uh, last week with uh, Low Prow offering a uh, rucksack as a prize for last week's competition, which we're about to announce, and of course this week's as well with Canon. So, uh, looking at last week's competition, um, Lowprow, the Fastback 350, I asked what was the dimensions of the rucksack? A very simple question. I had quite a few uh, entries to the competition, and uh, all the names have been punched into the computer. So, I'm just going to hit all the various buttons and find out which name is being pulled out of the electronic hat. And we have a winner. Congratulations to David Heels. David Heels of Sheffield Independent Film. Well, it sounds like going to be using the bag commercially uh, in uh, in Sheffield, strangely enough. So congratulations, David. Um, that bag will be going off to you first thing this week, uh, and you'll be receiving, receiving a very large box uh, worth about £80. So uh, take care of that. Enjoy it, and I hope you have hours of pleasure. And thanks again to Lopro for uh, giving us the prize. Uh, now, moving on to this week's show, um, we are thrilled that uh, Canon have donated a G9, uh, £400 uh, top of the range, 12 megapixel camera, and uh, as I say, I I'm absolutely in love with mine I think it's a phenomenal piece of kit it certainly isn't a lightweight uh, piece of kit by any stretch of the imagination but, uh, you know, you wouldn't expect that from a camera which delivers that sort of results, and uh, Whoever wins this is going to be thrilled to bits. So make sure you get your entries in. Now, the uh, entries is simple as this. The question I'm going to ask you is, although it's a 12 megapixel camera, can you tell me the size of the sensor? I want to know the actual size of the sensor on the camera. Now, the answer of which can be found on the Canon site, if you go to the G9 section, I'm sure it will quite clearly say to there exactly how big the sensor is, uh, but uh, that is the uh, that is the question. So what I want you to do is send me your the answer to the question, your name and address, uh, so I can get the camera shipped off to you, and send it to canon-competition at theoutdoorstation.co.uk that's canon hyphen competition at theoutdoorstation.co.uk and I wish everybody who enters that the best of luck now uh, to add to the thrill of this competition I'm actually going to be away for a couple of weeks I'm going to go and do the Cape Wrath Trail uh, and I'll be uh, walking up uh, the northwest of Scotland there for the next couple of weeks so this competition is uh, going to be open for two weeks 
up until the uh, end of the the second week there, which is what about the eighth, ninth? Uh, anyway, the details will be on the website on the competitions page. Uh, do click on that. Do answer the question. Uh, do join in and do uh, make sure you download the next program when I get back to see who has won this fantastic prize. So thanks again to Canon. Uh, can wish everybody the best of luck at entering the competition. And uh, I'm going to be uh, stopping these weekly shows now uh, just because I'm running out of time trying to do everything else. Uh, so a couple more, and I'll be back to just doing the occasional program about the specialist news and the outdoor news generally. Uh, so uh, until then. Have a good time. I'm off for a walk and take care of yourself. Bye bye now. This independent programme is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk.